Okay. Welcome everyone. Um, as you may know, and is written on my name, obviously here, tag here. My name is Kamran. We are doing dynamics this summer semester. It's eight weeks, three lectures a week, one hour and 45 minutes a day. And we are gonna do it by Zoom as you all hear and see. I mentioned this in the email I sent to the class, but just to clarify, the same Zoom link I send you, you're gonna use it for all the lectures. But if you need help with office hour, I usually use my personal ID. I emailed it to you. If you need, I can email it to class again. I haven't posted the uh, the syllabus because I wanna make a couple of adjustments based on maybe your idea. Uh, ask you a couple of questions and finalize it. But I will post my ID in the syllabus for office hours too. Probably today, tomorrow, I will post the syllabus so you can get all this information in, in Blackboard. Um, we are covering the entire, well, not the entire dynamics book, eight chapter, chapters of it. Four chapters go for particles, four chapters go for rigid bodies. I don't know if any of you have taken the course before, most likely not. Just to clarify this, dynamics is a somehow challenging course. And I tell you why, because it has uh, multiple concepts and the problem solving techniques are really, are really di diverse. So each problem may be solved, you know, different technique, unlike some other courses that, you know, is a typical, you can almost follow recipe to solve a problem. Dynamics is not like that. So you guys are needed to pay attention in the class, of course, the Zoom lectures, and spend some time solving problems. Um, there's no nothing to memorize, maybe some like other course like chemistry or other stuff. We usually develop some equations and use those equations to solve problems. And I guess most of you are mechanical. If some of you are civil or construction engineering, the, the concept is the same. Dynamics is a very fundamental course for mechanical civil engineering disciplines. Maybe less for civil engineers, but more for mechanical. You're gonna have courses that dynamics is their you know, prerequisite. So please make sure you spend quality time if you need help, you can ask me for help. During the regular semester, we have office hours. You can knock the door, come in the office. I usually give students open office hours. So anytime someone knocks the door of my office, you can you know, come in and ask questions. But because this is online course and I'm not in the office almost all of the summer, you can get an appointment by email. So you send, if you need help, you send me an email. Hey, Kamran, I need help with this subject. I usually respond very quickly. We can set a time for the same day or maybe the next day to meet with you in a Zoom session and address your question. And because it's a relatively short semester, eight weeks, please do not leave things for the later because we're gonna finish this so quickly. You have to start spending time on you know, reviewing the concept and solving examples and stuff like that, maybe to the evening. So with that uh, introduction, uh, I'm gonna share the screen. By the way, the attendance is mandatory. I usually check who is in and who is not. If you come late, few minutes is okay, but if you come like after one hour, I may consider that as an absent. If you have to leave early, Again, you let me know if it's few minutes, it's okay. But if it's like about an hour, I, you need to have like a legitimate reason to do that, okay? Any question about these basic things? Okay. So I'm gonna share the screen and start here. I guess you guys have the textbook. This is my information. Uh, again, as I said, I'm not in the office. You can use my university email address or my personal email address to contact me. Maybe this is preferred because I usually check that more frequently. Gmail, sometimes, you know, the emails go to the junk or, you know, bulk email. 
um this is your textbook i guess you all have it already anyone doesn't have the textbook so you you all have the textbook right okay so some of this course policies really apply to uh in person but attendance is the same i mentioned maybe you miss one lecture in eight weeks for whatever reason i will accept that but more than that we have to deal with it properly um in any case if you're if you're missing a lecture if it's like a legitimate reason or just miss it for no reason make sure you review the content of the course and uh, if you have questions you can ask me about it okay um again I've never had problem with unprofessional behavior in class in all of my lectures, but I put that just to be there. Um, for online, make sure your camera is on all the time. This was for the COVID. I think we know we don't need this anymore. And please do not use cell phone or tablets or other things. I know sometimes it might be boring looking at the screen for two hours continuously and paying attention, but as I said, this is a relatively complicated course so i need your attention so we can go through the concepts if you have any question you can ask me and we go from there um please make sure you participate in the questions i asked you in the discussions we have in the in the lecture again don't feel shy to ask question or maybe this is a silly question maybe this is a simple question i can assure you any question you face and you want to ask there are definitely a few more others in the class that they have the same question so when you ask it you don't stop the class from progress you do a favor to your friends to to create a you know discussion so and the other thing is i do not usually curve the final grades i look at individual performance so you 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 can think of you know what everybody did bad so we are safe because it's going to curve it hopefully we don't get to that point but I will try to look at every student's performance throughout the semester. If you miss, I don't know, like a reading properly for one quiz or, you know, for the midterm or you miss one homework at the beginning of semester for whatever reason, um, it's okay. We can talk about it and you can improve. And if you improve notably to show that that maybe low grade was an accident i will ignore that at the end it doesn't mean that you're going to lose one low grade that some professors do that's not the policy is about if you miss something you can improve it later this is how the grades will go 20 percent homework 20 percent quizzes midterm 25 and final 35 we may change these numbers depending on how we progress right but this is what i'm planning the final grades are standard uh, with a university policy. Every 10 grade goes one letter. And sometimes if you are close to the next letter, for example, if you get like 88.9 and your performance is good, I may help you a little bit, but the, it, that also depends on your performance. You have to do all the homeworks properly and everything. So we go from there. Now, that was about course policies and some stuff the question is why we do dynamics and can one of you guys or anyone says why <clears throat> dynamics why dynamics is important i'm going to ask kali did i pronounce your name properly kali it's kali kali okay sorry kali why dynamics I feel like dynamics is important because like, at least for me, I'm studying mechanical engineering and it's really important to understand how like particles and objects move. Why moving objects are of interest? Can we just Why deal they... with, because that's the question. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Um, because particles, when they're moving, have different forces acting on them than if they were stationary. 
and they impart different forces on things than if they were just uh, stationary. But we need to learn. But the question is why even why you are interested in these things? Of course, you know from your physics and even high school, when things move, there are particles, there are energy, kinetic potential energy, all of that. But the question is why we even deal with this? And it has a simple answer. Because it is really hard to find a system in a daily life that doesn't have moving parts, right? The majority of things from the cars and transportation to some of the, you know, even like sports and athletes and you go to production lines and there's a lot of mechanisms and things. So if you look at life, even this smartphone that you guys have, it looks like there's nothing moving in it, right? But the things that detect the motion, they have like in a nanoscale moving detection and moving stuff that to study those very complex systems, you have to go back to dynamics with the basics. So practically, there's nothing that does not move at all. Even if you look at bridges and buildings that they look, they don't move at all. They are designed for earthquake and you know wind and vibrations. So there are like small scale moving that affects everything. So the, the simple answer is we need to study dynamics because almost everything moves or if not everything, maybe 90 something percent of the systems we deal with in life move. So to, to be able to deal with them, you have to understand their motion and how the motion is created. Now, William talks about forces. We know that you probably know about kinetic potential energies, you know about momentum, and these are all the concepts we're gonna review in this course in more details. So that is really critical to understand the motion of a stuff. Now we separate it in particles and rigid bodies as we talk later, because sometimes it's easier to ignore the size of an, a moving object and consider like a point moving, but that's different things. But I gave you here a, a simple example, like windshield wiper, something everybody uses, you know, in a rainy day. And this is like typical family, right? And when you see the rain comes and you start using windshield wiper, it's one of the simplest things in the car everybody uses so frequently. But to be able to design something this simple, you need to answer some questions. Many of them is under dynamics you know, category. For example, you want to design, let's say this is your windshield, right? And these are the wipers. So how to create this geometry to cover most of the you know, windshield glass surface, right? And you may realize that what I put here because it's not real, is not a good design because we are missing a big portion here, right? So if this gets a little muddy or snowy and the driver sits here, it blinds you know, a, a big part of it, his view or her view. So when you design something like this, now let's analyze this. What are the design parameters to consider in designing a windshield wiper? I think windshield wiper is an example. Everybody knows it and almost everybody has used it, right? If you design a windshield wiper, what it should have, I mentioned one of them, proper geometry to cover the surface of the windshield in a good way that you don't miss any part, right? What else? Speed. Speed, you can go fast and slow, yes. What else? Speed itself is doesn't seem to be a problem, you can, get your electromotor moves slower or faster, but that slower faster means more or less force and power, which again goes back to dynamics. Okay, what else? Jake. Um, 
Did someone say it has to be like a certain contour depending on what windshield it is? That's what I mentioned, you know, the cert certain geometry that covers the certain part. What else? Um, I guess the material it's made out of. In well, case material, it like really it's true, really but cold. material is not, is not part of dynamics. But of course, you know, the, the blade itself is rubbery because you don't want to scratch the glass surface, right? And you want to make sure the contact is always there. That rubber shouldn't be worn so quickly. So you use it for two days and it's gone. Yeah, there's a lot of material engaged in that one. That's another part. That's one of the few things that's not part of dynamics. But yes, material is a part of design, you know, input and output. What else? I'm going to ask Aaron. Uh, location of joints and where you want it to swivel so you can get more surface area coverage. Which is part of geometry, I said at the beginning. What else? Have you guys ever seen there's a wet snow on the surface and the windshield is not strong enough to cover? It's not strong enough to move around? The type of materials you need to build it with this way is strong enough? Material is, but look at here. When the windshield moves, there's going to be some forces acting here, right? Those forces should be overcome by the electromotor, which is somewhere under here. The relation between that force and the electromotor and the mechanisms, links, and sizes, and everything is a part of dynamics. Now, when you design or when you calculate all the forces, then having this links be strong enough that that doesn't bend easily, that is another part. It's not part of dynamics, but is a result of dynamics. So if you look at here, and I don't know how easy it is to watch these YouTube clips. Uh, Anyone has a Mercedes here in the class? You're not that rich? No, not yet? Me neither. If you get rich enough, then dynamics helps you to make things complicated and expensive and then with more efficiency. Now, this is... Um... Hold on. Oh, God, it goes somewhere else. What? As you see, it has only one blade. I don't know how visible it is in the zoom, but when the blade gets here, it goes out. Because remember, if it's just a circular motion, you're going to create an arc, right? And you miss a lot of areas here. To be able to cover this area, the blade has to go out, kind of goes like this, goes like that, and goes like this back. So it goes out here, it comes down, it goes out, it comes back in, and does it like that. That is another way of designing a, a windshield wiper, right? So to see how that works, Apparently by now you have learned that I love Simpsons family very much. So I use them to help me with the course content. Now, I hope you guys can see it here that with this mechanism, as the blade gets here, is pushed out and add gets here, pushed back in, out, in, out, in, out, in, just like that. You see? Yeah. 
it goes out, goes in, goes out, goes in. So, and this is a mechanism with some complication. Your electron motor will be here and makes a continuous circular motion. This continuous circular motion will be turned to reciprocal motion on this link. And then this gear system creates a back and forth. So this is very complicated compared to a, a regular windshield wiper system, right? So as you see the geometry, the mechanism that creates that geometry, the forces. Now I'm gonna just list when you design a machine with moving system, what we do. First, you design and optimize the motion, just like this example I showed you, right? Your windshield blades have to cover most of the glass, specifically the areas that, you know, blocks the view of the driver. Then you design a system that provides this motion. You saw two examples, a two blade, with you know, kind of circular motion and a single blade with the uh, you know the, uh, the the Mercedes design. Then, when you do that, you have to analyze the mechanisms, get the equations. If the length one or two or different length changes, if the angles change, how those motions will change and how you can modify them and optimize them to have the perfect final motion of the system then you have to consider the forces that are acting on the mechanism here the resistance on the glass from the friction from the snow maybe it's like heavy muddy for off-road cars that resist to the motion of the blade you get those forces and translate it back to the electromotor that runs as you see how much of torque that electromotor should have to be able to move the final elements of the machine. And then based on that mechanisms and the forces, you can define how much force each element is you know, tolerating. And based on that, you do mechanical design for the strength of the element, then you choose the material. This is not just one step, it could be multiple steps as you know, designing for the strength, choosing the proper material, and then manufacturing process. This is technically three steps. A strength design, material selection, and manufacturing process. But if you look at the entire six or maybe eight steps of designing a system with moving elements like windshield wiper, these parts are all part of dynamics. To create a motion, a mechanism that does that motion, analyzing, applying the forces and all of that. So you see <clears throat> when you have a moving system, I just gave this example to show you the importance of dynamics. If you have a system with moving elements, the majority of the work you have to do to design it goes into dynamics. So please pay attention to this course, do the homework, and uh, hopefully we go somewhere. Was that inspiring or what? No, you guys don't care. I see the faces are like kind of, you know, neutral, no emotions. I see some smiles. Okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this is just an example to show why we do dynamics. Now that we want to do dynamics, the question is how we classify it. The, you can classify any subject into different ways. The way we do it here, has some logic or some you know concepts behind it. We talk about kinematics of the systems and we talk about kinetics of the system. Kinematics is analyzing the motion just for the geometry. We don't care what is the force, what is the what causes the motion, just move like this windshield wiper. Imagine you can apply infinite force, whatever needed just to create this reciprocal angular motion in the blades and analyze it, that is kinematics. Then if you wanna see what causes the motion, it's gonna be kinetics. That is relation between the motion and what causes the motion. You know by now from your physics that we have acceleration and velocity and movements. On the other side, we have force. 
and torque and energy and things like that. So we relate these concepts to one another and that becomes kinetics. Usually the first step is kinematics to create the motion, then analyze for the kinetics to see how much forces or energy or power you need. So this is one classification. The other classification is based on the system. Sometimes you can consider object as particles. Mathematically, particle is something that has zero dimension, but has mass. Now, do we have anything with zero dimension? No, even if you no. talk about atoms or electron or proton or particles that is small, it's still dimension, but I'm gonna ask, tell you what that means. Imagine you are analyzing the motion of a tennis ball in a court, right? Anyone plays tennis here? No? French Open is now on, so you can watch some good tennis on TV. You may realize if you watch tennis, you know that the tennis ball spins, right? They create a spin to create more curvatures. If you forget the spin, what you see when you watch on TV, you see that yellow dot going back and forth. It's almost like a dot, right? Compared to the size of motion. If you analyze the motion of the tennis ball, you can consider as a particle because everything kind of moves together. Same thing with basketball. Same thing with your car. Can you consider a car like a particle? Looks weird, right? Because car is so big, so many elements. But imagine you drive your car in highway, right? And you want to analyze the motion of the car on the highway. You can consider the whole thing as a simple object of one point moving on the road. So you don't analyze the parts in the engine. You don't consider tires, the transmission, the this and that. If you look like a satellite, you see a point moving around. So maybe a car could be a particle for certain analysis. So that's how we deal with particle. Otherwise, physically, nothing is particle, right? Is that clear? So when we analyze systems, either we consider them particles or we consider them rigid bodies. Now the same tennis ball, some of you, I suppose none of you have a fluid mechanics yet, but when you study fluid mechanics, the spin of the tennis ball dictates the path of motion. So technically you cannot neglect the spin, right? Which means you cannot neglect the size. The rotation of the ball is a part of it. Anyone play soccer here? Ricardo, you play soccer? You guys have heard like Bandit like Beckham, right? The famous movie in like in 20 years ago or something. When they do the free kicks, they create a spin and that the spin affects the path of motion. Now, a soccer ball could be considered as a particle if you just simply kick it. But if you want to analyze the spin, that rotation is a part of the system. Then you can consider it as a rigid body. I'm going to give you examples of rigid bodies later. We're going to have technically half of this course is about particles and half of it is about rigid bodies. Whatever we do with particles, we repeat it with the technically like kinematics of particles, kinematics of rigid bodies, kinetics of particles, kinetics of rigid bodies. If you go with forces with particles, we go with forces with rigid bodies. So we have the same chapters with the same name for particle and rigid body. Any question? Is it boring? Yet or not yet, huh? Okay. Now, Chapter 12 of the textbook, which is what we're going to start now, is about kinematics of particles. We start with the simplest type of motion. We develop some equations. Please do not be distracted by the first, the next, maybe three, four, five slides, which are very simple and you know it even from your high school. We created, like any other course, we start with the simplest case. We develop the concepts then we extend them to the more complicated cases and create new uh, concepts. So when we talk about particles, the simplest way of motion is rectilinear. Rectilinear motion is, of course, the particle moves on one straight line 
and you have only one independent variable to analyze. What it means is this, you have a straight line, you have an origin that you can put it anywhere you want, and the distance of the particle from this origin O is just a single number. You can use a vector to represent this motion, but because this is always on the same line, you can just use also a number like positive to the right, negative to the left. So if I tell you the position of particle P is positive five centimeter, this is your origin. You go five centimeter to the right, you find it. If I tell you it's like minus two feet, you go to the left two feet and you find the location. So technically you need one single independent variable or one single number to specify the motion. Is that clear? Okay. Curvilinear motion, as the name says, when you have a curve path of motion, for the curve, you need two or three independent variables to specify the motion. For example, here, this is in a plane. To be able to analyze the motion, you need to tell me the length of this vector r and the angle theta. So I need two numbers. If it was 3D, you need the third, for example, the z, the, the height. So, or maybe in Cartesian system, you need x and y for 2D, x and y and z for 3D. So that is how curvilinear motions are analyzed. Any question? Now, for the kinematics, to be able to understand the motion, we usually have three steps. First is the geometry, which means position and displacement. Then we need to understand the velocity and then acceleration, right? For example, imagine you travel from Edwardsville to Chicago and you have a flat tire somewhere in the road and you want to call your brother, sister, friend to help you. How you tell them where you are? Do you use X and Y? What do you say? I don't know what the highway number is. Let's say they're like highway, I don't know, 55. You say, listen, I left from Edwardsville, highway 55, you go 45 miles, I am right there, right? So that 45 miles is your position, right? On that curve path. It's a single number. We're gonna talk about that later. But that is the position. If you want to go from Edwardsville to Chicago, do you know how much is the distance? You have never gone to Chicago by car? I think it's about 275 miles or something. Something. So if you go from Edwardsville to Chicago, that 275 mile is your displacement, right? Now, where we come to velocity? You drive from Edwardsville to Chicago and the police stops you to give you the ticket. Why they give you the ticket? Anyone has got ticket recently? My last one is like the speeding. Minutes. Yes, speeding. Speeding means the police deals with your velocity or your speed, right? That's what you get the ticket for. So the velocity of you, and I said a car, you can consider like a particle. How about acceleration? How you use this analogy for acceleration for car? Do you get ticket for acceleration? Do you know where accelerations come to play? How much you pay for your car? When they say zero to 64 seconds or six seconds or like my car 15 seconds, that's how much money you pay, right? Acceleration. So these are the three Technically four, if you separate position and displacement, but generally position and displacement, if you could put it at the one category, these are the three characteristics of emotion that we need to know and understand to say we understand the motion, right? So everything we analyze here, and you see we're gonna use different techniques to analyze the motion. First, we go with position and displacement. Then we go to determine the velocity and then acceleration. And after that, we know the motion. There's nothing after acceleration when it comes to kinematics. 
any question. You guys are very quiet. Make me feel sleepy. If I fall asleep when I'm talking, it's your fault, okay? And if you fall asleep, it's possibly my fault. Let's see who, who, who wins first. Now, as I said, the simplest type of motion is rectilinear. The particle moves on a straight line and is continuous, right? So technically, you have a straight line, which is path of motion. Your particle P goes left and right on this line. To be able to analyze it, we usually use a vector to give the position of a particle in a system. If your system, anyone, by the way, anyone knows how we define what is vector? Andrew, you're very quiet. What is vector? Um, a vector is a, I think of it as like a ray in a certain direction for, uh, for a certain amount of space or measurement. It's it conceptually is right, but I need a more like engineering accurate definition. How about I ask Ricardo, my soccer buddy? Ricardo, if he were in the class, we could play soccer one weekend, but maybe for the sure next semester. Mm -hmm. Ricardo, it's how so, we define so, vector? So vector is a force has a specified direction. Force is a vector, but vector is not force. Is an example. Kelly, I'm gonna have to get back to you. You know, I'm going to make 50% of question from the boys in the class, 50% from the girls. You are the only girls who get 50% of the questions. How about that? <laughs> um, a vector has both magnitude and direction. Direction. So ve vector is a physical quantity that has a magnitude and direction. So force has magnitude and direction. And what Andrew says said almost the same thing, but this is more precise definition, right? now. You can define this vector. This is the magnitude, this length, and this is the direction. Because on rectilinear motion, the particle is always on the same line. The direction really doesn't matter because it's always like that. You can use say, simply just a number S, as I said, positive, negative, like minus two, plus five, and show the position, right? So this is how you define the position of a particle on rectilinear motion. The next one is displacement. And remember, you need to have a reference point to measure stuff. So I put O here as reference. So from here to here is the length. Displacement is change of position. So particle P goes from here to a new position P prime here. Its position vector was R and becomes R prime. So technically, the displacement vector is r prime minus r, which is this delta r. Again, because everything is on the same line, you can also say the position, because it's on the line, is s prime minus s, which is this delta s. So r is the vector, s is a scalar. And just to refresh your memory, scalar is a physical quantity that has only magnitude. Now, Kelly, give me some examples of scalars in physics or in like daily life. Something that has only magnitude. Um, well, something that has only magnitude could be like counting the amount of something. No, like phys <clears throat> physical, you know, quantities. I'm going to go to, how you pronounce it, crystal ball? Yeah, that's it. Um, speed. Speed. Speed is actually, it has direction. I mean, the speed, the number, yes, but velocity, because you go to the left and right or north or south. How about that? Give me an example of scalar quantity. Uh, let me think. How about time? Uh, time is a scalar, right? Yeah. It's just a number, doesn't have direction. How about temperature, right? Temperature doesn't have direction. Pressure is only number, right? So these are quantities that have 
our scale is just a number. Now, if we deal with rectilinear motion, you can only use the number S. It could be positive, negative, because the direction is already set to be on this line. That's why it's the simplest way of analyzing. You don't need the direction, just single independent parameter, which is technically this S value. So we dealt with position, we dealt with displacement. What is the next step based on that previous slide to understand the motion? We had three, right? Position, displacement, what was one? What is the next one? You can cheat and look at the slides. You guys didn't print the slides, right? The next step is velocity, right? Remember the police stop? So after that velocity, how do we define velocity? Velocity is the rate of displacement. So technically, whatever displacement you have, delta r, you divide it by the time, it gives you the velocity. Now, this is why velocity is a vector, because displacement is a vector. We divide it by time, which is a scalar number. So the result will be a vector. We have average velocity, which goes for entire displacement over entire time. And you have instantaneous velocity, which, is go, which goes for very small displacement over a small time. You know that very small quantities, we, we use differentials to use. So dr over dt is velocity. And on the straight line, ds over dt is going to be v. We are still talking about a straight line. So this vector, velocity is still vector, but because it's always in this direction, left and right, you can just use the number. So technically, the average velocity is what you measure. Like, for example, yesterday, I drove from Columbus, Ohio to Atlanta, Georgia in like eight and a half, nine hours. 560 miles divided by eight and a half hours, my average speed is, for example, 60 something miles per hour, right? But instant velocity is what you see or you read on your speedometer. It goes like 65, 72, 75 sometimes, and you don't do that. I reached 90 stuff for a few seconds, few times, because it was a rental car. I didn't know how good it is, so I just pushed a little more. But that is, technically, you get ticket for instant velocity, right? So instant, so D, uh, DSDT, and again, I'm, I'm explaining this in details. I'm sure you all remember this from your physics, right? Nothing new up to here, right? Okay. So what is the next step? William, next oh, step. Acceleration. Acceleration, yes. Acceleration. Yes. So for the acceleration, what is acceleration? Velocity was the time rate of displacement. Acceleration is the time rate of velocity. So technically, the velocity of particle P here is V as position P. When it goes to P prime, its velocity is V prime. So it's, it definitely changes, right? This change, delta V over delta T is average acceleration. Or if you want to get instant velocity, you get dv over dt. Remember, position can be positive, negative because it goes to the right or left, right? Velocity could be positive, negative. If you go toward the positive direction of your axis, your velocity is positive. If you go backward, your velocity is negative. For acceleration, you can still move forward, but if your velocity is smaller, this delta v will be negative, right? So the negative positive acceleration has nothing to do with the direction of motion, is with change of velocity. So when you push the gas and your speed goes from 60 miles to 75, your acceleration is positive. When you push the brake and you go from 75 to 52, your velocity decreases, delta V is negative, your acceleration is negative. Any question? Yun, are you good? So I know we have some international students. Am I speaking too fast? Is it is it understandable? If you guys need me to repeat, please feel free, okay? Don't feel shy or something. You can just ask me, come on, can you repeat that again? Is the pace of speaking good for everyone? I know I have accent, but do you understand my English? Is it good? Yeah. Do you approve it? 
Can I go for citizenship now? Yes, okay. <clears throat> now, we are engineers. I always say engineers deal with the physical phenomena or phenomenon or multiple phenomena depend on you know the subject you know it could be thermal fluidic structural you know motion whatever we deal with the physical phenomenon we create equations and then use those equations to solve problems and solve you know run projects we created some equations like v is dr dt or ds dt here a is dv dt if you replace v from here, you get D2, S, D, T2. Now, we want to eliminate the time between these things. Now, I'm gonna do this on my tablet because sometimes writing it is easier. And I'm sure you have seen this before, but I'm gonna have to switch to uh, my tablet. You guys see my tablet right now, right? Yeah. Okay, where were we? I, I, we were here. Okay, this is from, it's funny that this is from last summer, I suppose. Let's just make a new one. So, as I mentioned, we have V as DS DT, right? And A as dv dt or d2s dt2 if i want to eliminate t here i can get dt is ds over v can i do that sure now if i replace this guy here i'm going to get a is equal to dv divided by this guy, ds dv. And if I want to make this look nicer, this is technically dv over one. I'm going to do that. So you're going to get a is equal to, uh, sorry, this should be v, not dv. I'm using this guy. So A is going to be V, V times DV over DS. And I can simplify this as A DS equals V DV. You see, in this equation, the time is eliminated. Doesn't mean that time, still time is a part of motion, but I could eliminate that. And then if you want to calculate velocity or whatever, if you have equations for this, you can simply integrate A, ES, and V, DV from, for example, S1 to S2, and this from V1 to V2. Do you guys know what is the integration for this guy? Integration of V, DV? Uh, v squared over two. Yeah, so you're going to get V2 square over 2 minus V1 square over 2. How about this guy? This side? Yeah. That's just A, isn't it? No. You see? The, the integration argument is ds. So unless you know a in terms of s, you cannot solve it. Because a could be anything. So technically... I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, the right-hand side... about it as a number. Yeah, no, it's not number. Acceleration doesn't have to be constant number, right? We can have a case of constant acceleration. But if acceleration... Remember, in the that's a good observation. In, in motion, anything can vary, right? Displacement... Position varies, creates velocity. Velocity varies, creates acceleration. And acceleration could be variable, right? For example, right. when you accelerate 
from start to go to 60, you have more acceleration at lower speeds, right? As you go to a higher gear, your acceleration reduces, right? So acceleration right. is that constant. So technically, if you want to simplify this on the right left hand side, you're going to get a e s equals v2 square minus v1 square divided by two. This you can always do it because it's just v dv. It's like x dx, right? It's going to be x squared by two. But this side, you have to see what function a is and based on that do the integration does that make sense right okay now let's go back to share this screen again so this is technically the same thing that i did there i calculate dt from here substitute it here and simplify it and get these things so remember this is the general form if a is a number you can simplify this but a may not be a constant number okay because the students frequently make mistakes simplify this as like a delta s because this is like a constant that's not the case any question And again, remember, all of this is for rectilinear motion because we replace dr with ds. So there's no vector stuff. It's on a straight line. We are still in the category of rectilinear motion. Okay? Any question? Am I going too slow? Because I can finish the whole chapter in 10 minutes. Right? And give you an exam at the end of the lecture today. You don't want to do that. By the way, when we finish each chapter, probably not finish, finish. When we get close to finish, for example, today we're going to move forward to some extent. I will post the homework for the chapter. And I give you a deadline, which is like three, four days, right? We can't give you like 10 days deadline because we're going to chapter two more we were going to finish two more chapters by end of that deadline. So we have to be short. And I try to give you some quizzes for chapter one and two as we move forward. So kind of give you a feedback. If the pace of your study, the how much time you spend, how much problem you solve is good enough or not. Okay. So technically, we may have a quiz next Monday covering this chapter. Okay. So now let's talk about the examples that i think it was william had in mind how about if the acceleration is constant if the acceleration is constant v ac equals dvdt you know what let me just write this down too because it might be easier to go step by step let me share the screen and i'm sorry before you could click on one thing and you could switch from one screen to the tablet now you have to spend like 15 seconds making multiple clicks until it works okay now we are talking about constant acceleration right so a is ac you remember we defined a as dv over dt right so i can write this as dv is a dt and then integrate it for example from v1 to v2 and from t1 to t2 sometimes you start from zero but i'm going to keep it general now if the acceleration is constant this is going to be ac right and the constant comes out of integral so the left side is going to be v2 minus v1 equals ac t2 minus t1. And if t1 is zero, a lot of time we start the motion at zero time and start it from there, then you're going to get v2 is act plus v0. I'm going to call this as v0 because it's at t0. You get this guy, right? Or two could be any time you can simply say V is 
ACT plus V0. You see, V is a function of time now because time is variable. Initial velocity, initial velocity is a number that you know. For example, you start from five meter per second or two inches per second or whatever. Acceleration is constant, is a part of something that someone gives to you. And then based on that, you can find your velocity at any time. Two seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds. How about minus five seconds? Do we have minus five seconds? No. If you want to go, if you want to put your time reference in the middle of motion, then you can go back. It's okay. But usually when you start from zero and the motion happens after that, time is usually positive, right? That's why, we, okay. Now I got this velocity equation. I'm going to write it with blue. So V as a function of time is ACT plus V0. This was the result of this equation. A is dv dt, right? Now we're going to go back to the definition of velocity. V was ds dt, right? Which means ds is v dt. Do I know v? Because the left-hand side, the integration is easy. You go from s zero to s you go from t equal zero to t right do i know v hmm? christopher do i know v with the previous equation yes yeah just just you know we just calculated so i'm going to substitute this guy there so i'm going to get a c t plus v zero time dt from zero to t. And if you do this integral, the left side is going to be s minus s. Remember, just because time is zero doesn't mean your original position is zero. You could be like few yards or feet or whatever off the origin. So this s zero is that position. And here you're going to get a c t squared by two plus v zero t. And if you want to find S as a function of time in general, S is going to be AC T squared by 2 plus V0 T plus S0. And this, right. For constant acceleration, you have equation number one and equation number two. You remember we developed one more equation where we eliminated time now i'm going to use that guy we had a ds equals v dv right if i integrate this from s0 to s and this is constant and this goes from v0 to v then you're going to get ac s minus s0 equals v square by two minus v zero square by two equation number three so you can use these three equations to solve problems right remember again this is rectilinear motion that means the system moves on a straight line so if you know s the length or the distance from the origin between the origin and the particle that's all you need and your variable could be time like here or could be s like here you guys have seen these equations before right in high school maybe and in like physics one or something so let's go back to the slides so technically the equations you have here is the same thing you get this guy then for the displacement you replace this you get this guy and for velocity acceleration displacement you get this guy 
if a problem is given to you, it depends on if the time is involved, you can use this. If time is not involved, you can use this thing. Sometimes you have to replace time from here and calculate it, put it somewhere else. And But these are the three equations. Remember, students very frequently, specifically at the beginning of semester, use this for any acceleration. Remember, we started with constant acceleration. That's why we could do this integral. If A is not constant, you cannot use this. You have to know what it is and then do this integral. Make sense? If you need to write this down, please write it down or highlight it that any of this equation is for constant acceleration. Now let's do an example. You have two particles, A and B. They start from the rest at the origin. So their initial velocity is zero. Their initial position is zero. They move on a straight line. The acceleration of A is given as a function of time. The acceleration of B also is given as a function of time. You want to see the distance between them after four seconds and also how much distance each of them travels. So if you get the distance of each one, we can subtract and see how much the distance between them. So is the definition of problem clear? We have two particles with rectilinear motion and variable acceleration. The acceleration is given as a function of time, right? So I'm going to keep this here for a second. So if you have not printed the thing, you can use it here. And I'm going to write down those information on my tablet. So V0A is 0, V0B is 0, S0A 0, S0B 0, and then AA is 60 minus 3, and AB is 12 T square minus 8. The units are feet and feet per second. So now let's go to the tablet. This is technically the information we have, right? Now to analyze velocity displacement position of A, I'm gonna use uh, blue for A. So VA is integration of AA dt, right? From zero to t, to any t. So if you put six t minus three, dt. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to do this integral. I hope you guys remember, you know, differentiation and integrals from your calc or other courses. And let me complete this by, you know what, let's just do this. So this guy is zero. Right? We got the same. Now for acceleration, for, sorry, for displacement, SA is integration of, or you know what? Let's fix that one here. And do the same thing here because this is also integration.
And if you do that, again, this is going to be zero. I'm not going to go to this step because T0 is zero. So technically your SA is T cube minus three, two T square, right? So at T equals four, how much is my SA? You guys calculate this and give me the number. It was after four seconds, right? <clears throat> Let me see the problem. Yeah, after four seconds. How much is the number? Come on, guys. You need, you need to calculate this. I know this is very basic, simple, but please do it step by step and do that because that helps you to you know, get used to these things. I got 40. Forty. Is this correct? That's what I got. Hold on. How much is TQ? Uh, 64. Yeah, I did. Okay, 40. Now we're going to do the same thing for B. This time I'm going to let you do it in two minutes and I do it with the red color later. And I don't see what you do. Of course, you may escape it, but please, it's a, it's a very simple stuff, but make sure you do it. This is acceleration of B. I want you to follow the same steps exactly. Do the integral and calculate SB and give it to me. Two minutes or whatever, two and a half minutes. Anyone got the answer? Uh, 192. 192? 
Okay, I'm going to write here SP192. Remember, anytime you give the number, you have to give the unit. It okay. used to, because you know, 192 doesn't mean much. Like it's an inch, right. feet, yard, millimeter, meter, whatever. So let's do it now. Uh, we know that VB is integration of AB, which was 12. T squared minus eight DT. So VB is gonna be four T cube minus eight T. Did you get the same? Yep. Okay. Then SB is integration of four T cube minus eight T DT from zero to T. So your SB is gonna be T4 minus uh, 4T square. You got the same? Yep. Then you substitute, you get SB. Now, SB minus, because, I mean, that's the basic, of course. It says the distance, the dif distance between them, you're going to get SB minus SA, which is 192 minus 4T. It's going to be 152 feet distance between them after four seconds. So this was a, a simple example showing, you know, how rectilinear motion works. You have acceleration, you integrate it, you get velocity, displacement, positions, and everything you can calculate that. Any question about this? Looked easy, right? Now, let's do another example. This example has S in it, right? So it says a particle travels to the right along a straight line. You may consider right is positive with the velocity, which is a function of displacement or function of position. You want to find it's deceleration or let's say acceleration could be negative when S is two meter, right? So I let you write these numbers and I'm going to write it on my stuff. So this is what the problem says, right? Velocity is given as a function of displacement, right? And we want to find acceleration. How do we do this? Any recommendation? Anything?
try and find the final velocity and the initial velocities. So you can use it with the uh, distance and acceleration equations. Remember, we talked about the case that the, uh, what's called? You don't have velo uh, time involving the equations, right? Remember that? Yes. How did we solve it? How, what was the equation we had? Uh, final velocity squared equals initial velocity squared plus two times acceleration times displacement. That was for constant. I'm glad you made that mistake because we're just, you know, I mentioned that that's for constant acceleration, right? So the equation we had was A dS is equal to V dV, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, can I write this as A is equal to V times dV over dS? Can I do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, you look at this equation here, right? And you look at this equation here that is given. Anything comes to your mind? Technically, I am looking for dvds, right? Right. And I have v as a function of s. So from this guy, find dv ds for me because if i'm going to substitute a is going to be i'm going to substitute v here as 5 over 4 plus s right and i need this guy to substitute and this guy you get it from here what is dvds it's the derivative of v with respect to s yes give it give me the number or the, the equation dv over ds is equal to is this the case yes wait right so if that's the case yeah, i'm going to put here Minus five, four plus S square, right? And then you calculate your A. Make sense? Yeah. Now, you remember I told you like a few minutes, maybe about an hour back that dynamic dynamics has a little some challenging stuff. So first of all, if you put S equals two and you substitute here, you get your A as minus 0.116 meter per square second, right? And you see the minus that comes out of uh, differentiation here makes it negative. <laughs> That's why it calls find the deceleration. It could just find, because you know, negative acceleration is deceleration, but negative number is a number, no big deal. Right? 
Now we solve two problems from the same first, I don't know, two pages of the, the content, completely different approach. One was a straightforward, just integrating over time. This guy was a little tricky because from here, you have to rewrite it like this and realize that I need to find this guy from this equation, right? And then the rest was simple math. But being able to see, I'm going to put S, the S here and create this, which allows me to take, you know, differentiate this and make it that that's something that you need to practice to get a little experience. We can start another problem that is solved differently, right? And that is the, the part of challenge with dynamics. In many chapters, some chapters are maybe more straightforward, but many chapters, including this one, each problem may have a different technique. Now, you may say, I can't solve like 200 problems to learn 200 techniques, of course, right? But anything we do here, it gives you a little hint how to look at the problems, right? Gain some experience and combine them later when you get other problems. Any question? Are we good? Yep. Did these two problems impress you enough that you need to spend quality time on this one? Or I need to scare you more? So rectilinear motion, as I mentioned, is the simplest type of motion that the particle moves on a straight line and uh, you only need one parameter to analyze the motion and which is like that S value that the length of the, you know, the distance from origin to the particle. If you know it, you can take the derivatives, get velocity acceleration. If you know acceleration, you can integrate it, go backward. Whatever is given, you can do it. Now, if you want to make it more complicated, you make your path of motion arbitrary, which means it, it's not a straight line anymore. It's, we call it curvilinear, right? A curvilinear motion is when the path of motion is either two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Remember, a straight line, one dimension, just S or X or whatever parameter you assign. When you have it, path in a plane, you need two parameters. When you have a path in 3D, curved path in 3D, you need three parameters. Regardless of how we do it, those three steps are going to be the same. The position, you're going to specify with position vector. Now, this time you have to actually use a vector with the length and direction. If you want to get displacement going from point P, to P prime, position is R goes to R prime, your delta R is gonna be the position vector. As it moves on this path S, you can still use S as location of the point on the path. Same example I gave you when you say I'm like 45th mile in highway, I don't know, 55 from certain point, this length is that 45 miles, right? The length of the path. But delta R is technically a straight line connecting the two points. Delta S that you see here, and I don't know if you can make it bigger. I guess I can. Delta S is this tiny blue curvature. You may realize that if P and P prime are close, delta R and delta S are kind of close too, right? But regardless, delta S is a scalar, delta R is a vector. Right? Any question about that? So position, displacement, the next step. Colin, the next step. Velocity. Velocity, yeah. So we go for velocity. Again, <clears throat> for the average velocity, delta R, the displacement between time one and two, 
divided by delta t, which is t2 minus t1, right? Average velocity. <clears throat> Still, it's a vector. But when you make p and p prime very close, <clears throat> which means you take this delta <clears throat> and take the limit to zero, which means delta r becomes dr, delta t becomes dt, then <clears throat> your velocity becomes instant velocity. Interestingly, and probably you remember this before from, you know, maybe calc or physics one, two, some, something, as P1, P and P prime get closer to one another, you may realize that this delta R becomes tangent to the path of motion. It's kind of obvious here. I mean, it's visible, not obvious, visible, even if this delta R is kind of big. If the two points come very close to one another, then this vector becomes tangent to the path, which means the velocity of P, <clears throat> the instant velocity of P, which is a vector, will be tangent to the path of motion. And that's mathematically proven. Any question about the, this concept? So from now, we remember velocity is always tangent to the path of motion. Even for rectilinear, which is line, tangent to a line is the same line, right? So this V, the vector V is tangent to the path of motion at this point. If the point P goes here, then velocity is gonna be tangent to the path like that. The magnitude depends on how much, you know, it moves fast or slow, but the direction of the vector always tangent. This could be a small vector, could be larger than this, depends on how fast it goes, but the tangent part wouldn't go away. And if you want to find the magnitude of the speed, right? This is the whole vector. You can use the still S, the length of the curvature with the curve to find the velocity. This is technically the, what you see on your speedometer again. Even when you drive in a highway that has, you know, curves and curves left and right, the number you see is this guy, but the vector of the velocity is always tangent to the path. Any question? Are we good, everyone? So please do not forget this because sometimes this tangent part is a piece of information you have and you may need to solve the problem. <clears throat> Now, the next step is to find acceleration. But before that, I don't know how visible is this video. I found it very interesting. I'm going to play this. I think it looks better when I record, save the videos that I'm uh, recording, and you can see it later. But this is a very good example of uh, curvilinear motion. I don't know what this sport is called. Anyone knows what is this? They wrote, this is not a sphere it looks like a wheel kind of you know, like a kind of a spherical type of wheel oops and see what happens you see it comes on a curve and makes a one more time if you look at this i want to look at the the overall path when it comes here i'm going to show you almost what you see it comes like this and then makes a curve coming here so it's completely curvilinear you can consider this like a particle and that's how it is do you guys know what this sport is called I think it should be no good idea. Hmm? What? I said no idea. Okay, yeah, me, me neither. I think it's good for grandma, grandpas, because you don't have too much motion, just, you know, roll the thing. But you can see 
how perfectly that i mean this is like as perfect as you can get how it, it's interesting how human brain works because to do something like that with the robot you have to have all the technology and information and you know robotics most advanced stuff to create emotion like that but with the calculation in the mind and the, the brain and you know the experience he pushed these things that it's not a ball but let's call it ball rolls it in a way that it goes such a complex curvilinear motion i think this is a very good example of how curvilinear motion could look like right i found it fascinating so I hope you enjoyed it too. I don't know how visible it is, but anyway, but that's an example of curvilinear motion. So when you do that, the next step is to find acceleration, right? Acceleration is change of velocity. At point P, velocity is tangent to the path. Point P prime, tangent to the path. Even if the magnitude is the same, the two vectors are gonna have, you see, some changes. This is V, this is V prime. This is delta V. And again, this delta V over delta T gives you a vector of average, which doesn't mean really much. But if you take the limit and the P and P prime are very close, then it's going to be dV over dt. And that's how the instant acceleration is. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Is this acceleration A normal to the path of motion or tangent to the path of motion? Because velocity is tangent, right? The question is, is acceleration normal or tangent or just none of them? It could be anything. Hi, Z. You give me the answer this time. I think it's tangent. Is it tangent? So let's examine. If the velocity is tangent to the path and acceleration is tangent to the path, that means they're in the same direction. So the, the velocity shouldn't change its direction, right? But apparently in this example is a curve, it changes the direction. So maybe not tangent. Is it normal now? That's, that's normal. It, the answer is none of them. I just tried to confuse you so you remember this better. Acceleration doesn't have to be tangent or normal to the path. It could be actually the combination of both, right? It could be any direction. And you can divide it in tangent and normal. But the, the, the direction of acceleration vector doesn't have to be tangent or normal to the path of motion. You can say it's a combination of them, one of them zero, one of them not zero, none of them zero. So but I just want to bring this up so you know that for the velocity, it has to be tangent to the path. Acceleration is could be anything. We're going to see later it could be anything, right? Any question? So technically, at this point, this is the acceleration. It kind of looks like normal, but if you look normal, it's kind of this way. So it has a little bit of off from normal. And as I said, it could be anything. Depends on the type of motion, the type of path, how change of velocity value, you know, is lower rate, higher rate, how much the curvature changes, all of that contribute to the acceleration. But the final conclusion, I repeat it again, velocity always tangent to the path, Acceleration could be anything, right? Any question? Okay. So when we talk about curvilinear motions, rectilinear motion is easy. A single line, a single number, no big deal. When we deal with curvilinear motion, there are different coordinate system that we can use, depends on the type of the motion, depends on the geometry, depends on the information we have, we can use one of them. Those coordinate systems are Cartesian coordinate system that you know, X, Y, Z, normal and tangential. I'm gonna briefly explain what that means and cylindrical or polar coordinate system, right? 
we're going to cover these three type of coordinate system next time in the next lecture. But just to show you what that means, I'm just going to show you this. For Cartesian, you have the origin somewhere. You have axis X and Y and Z. And if this is the path of motion, the particle's position can be divided or expressed in terms of X, Y, and Z. So the vector is like X times I. You know I, J, K are unit vectors in X and Y and Z direction, right? So the position vector could be, could be expressed in terms of I, J, K values. For normal and tangential, you create two directions. One, tangent to the path of motion. One, normal to the path of motion. Because this curvature changes, here, X and Y and Z are all the same directions. But here, you may realize that now tangent is this, normal is that. You go here, tangent looks like this, normal looks like that. So this UN and UT, which are unit vectors in two directions, their own direction changes. A lot of motions are good to study like this because conceptually it makes sense. We're going to talk about that later. You see it. And then cylindrical coordinate system, technically you have your R and theta and Z. So this is technically your R in the plane. Oops, sorry. This is your theta. And this is the, so the point P is here. The position vector is like this. But the three parameters to express it is this length r, this angle theta, and this elevation z. We're going to analyze curvilinear motions using this three coordinate system in the next parts of the chapter. I think we have like three, four minutes left. I'm going to cut it short now because I don't want to start something in the middle. So you guys owe me four minutes, okay? Any question about what we talked about today? No, we're good. Okay, so um, before you go, I usually take a screenshot of this, uh, you know, setup to for the attendance so I can see who is who, right? So just give me a second. I do this screenshot. When we are done with this chapter, with this uh, session, uh, it takes some time for uh, Zoom to convert this to a video and save it. After that, sometimes in the afternoon or later night or whatever, I will post the video of this lecture in the website. If you have seen the Blackboard page, we already have one folder for chapters, PPT files or notes, right? We have one folder for problems. I'm going to post the problems that you're going to solve there. There will be another folder for the submission links so you can submit your homework online. Another folder that I submit or post the solutions of the homework, right? And I think there's one, if not, I'm going to create a folder for lecture videos. So it's going to be linked to the videos that you can uh, you know, click and watch if you want to review some of these. And by the way, I saw some of the questions I asked you guys answered in the chat. When I share the screen, I don't see the chat. So if you want to answer my questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and say it so everybody can hear it. If it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. As I said, don't feel shy to answer the question because it might be wrong. Because as I said, a lot of questions I ask, I do not expect you guys to know the answer because the concept is new. Why I ask it? Because I want you to analyze the small pieces of information you have, limited information you have, analyze it in your mind and come up with a conclusion. If the conclusion is right, good. If the conclusion is not right, you will learn it quicker because you already processed it in your head, right? And you realize that what part of your process wasn't right. So please don't feel shy. I make mistakes frequently. There's no one that doesn't make mistake, obviously, right? So don't feel shy to say something that, oh my God, it could be like kind of silly or could be wrong. It doesn't matter. I'm not expecting the right answer most of the time because the concept is new, right? I just want you to process it and say something. Does that make sense? 
Any question? Did you guys enjoy the first lecture? Seriously? Yeah. It was it was boring, right? I saw some faces that kind of what the hell? Please, please finish it, right? Believe me, when I'm in the class, it's more fun. I joke around and do stuff more, but you know, with the with the Zoom, it's hard to be funny and make jokes because you know, you look at the screen, I look at the screen, there's no human come, you know, touch or like eye contact exactly. So I tried to joke during the COVID, it didn't work. So it was like ugly. <laughs> it wasn't even funny. So, but I, by the way, if you think in the middle of the lecture, you need like three, four minutes break, we can create a break, you know, for three, four minutes, just give you like, you know, you take a glass of water or something. Okay. Thank you very much. I see you guys on Wednesday, same time, same link, and you enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.